we're all sombered by it, but perhaps also hopeful people too that uh, our God hasn't taken his eye off the ball. Uh, our God still is a sovereign God. And he wants to speak to us this morning. It's my privilege to be with you and to spend a few minutes opening up God's word. And uh, as we do, let's just pray once more for God's help to understand God's word. Let me thank you that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. We thank you that you are a speaking God. We pray now that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. For your glory's sake we ask it. Amen. Well, there's this thing called YouTube. And uh, apparently Inverkeegan Baptist Church has its own channel there, so I was able to tune in to the last couple of weeks of, of services anyway. Uh, and last week, it seems, if I've got the dates right, you started with a little church history quiz. Is that, that correct? So what better thing to do than start with another uh, church history quiz? So... Uh, I hope you'll have heard of Martin Luther, of course, the great reformer from the 16th century, 1517. A few years back, we marked the anniversary of the Reformation to Martin Luther's nailing of the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. Um, Some years later, very dramatic and eventful life, but in the 1530s, he'd settled back into university life in Wittenberg, was lecturing on scripture, And he had this to say about one of the passages that he was lecturing on. Picked out a couple of verses and said this, that these two verses set forth the summary of all Christian teaching, the sun that enlightens the church. If this teaching stands, the church stands. If it collapses, the church also collapses. Now there's a fair few verses to pick from. But I wonder if you have any guesses what verses Martin Luther might have been talking about. Genesis 1? Genesis? No. We might think, oh, well, Luther, it's got to be Romans, doesn't it? Or maybe Galatians, or maybe John 3.16. In fact, uh, Luther was at that point lecturing through a little collection of psalms that we know of, the Songs of Ascents the songs of going up that are found in Psalms 120 to 134. And the two verses that he had in mind were verses 3 and 4 from Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. These are the verses that Luther was referring to and saw here in them the gospel claim that if these verses stood, the church stood. If, if these verses fell, the church would fall. But it's this psalm that I'm inviting us to spend a few minutes to think about this morning. I'm hoping we'll hear what it has for us to say and it will challenge and encourage us. In fact, there's a number of echoes with Psalm 31 that you were looking at last week uh, and in some ways uh, connects up with what Bill was speaking of a couple of weeks ago with the way that the gospel transforms us, changes our minds. So I'll read the psalm for us and then we'll take a little tour through some of its highlights. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who would stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. Watchmen for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. With him is full redemption. He himself 
will redeem Israel from all their sins. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word to our lives this morning. Well, it may be a familiar psalm, but when we slow down, read it slowly, thoughtfully, I think there are some surprises here for us. And so that's what we'll do in these next few minutes. But first, a little bit of a tour through its structure. You know, it's always a good practice when you're reading a passage of Scripture. Ask yourself, how does it hang together? How, what's it, how does it flow? If I was drawing a little map of this passage, what would that map look like? If we do that for this passage, I think we can see that quite quickly it falls into two sections. The first four verses quite clearly addressed to God. As you can see, I've highlighted the yous there. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Let your ears be attentive. If you, Lord, this is a direct address to God. But the second set of four verses, verses five to eight, is now speaking not to God, speaking about God. And God's referred to as him or his. In his word, I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, speaking of the Lord rather than to him. With him in verse 7 is for redemption. He himself speaking about the Lord rather than to the Lord. So right away we can see there's these two corresponding sections. And those themselves then also split up quite naturally into two sets of pairs. The first two lines, don't worry, we'll see a bit bigger print soon. Uh, The first two lines we hear the psalmist cry out. In verses 3 and 4, the second pair of verses, we hear the content of that prayer. In the third pairing, verses 5 and 6, we have that sense of hopeful waiting, that waiting that Michael already was uh, speaking helpfully to us about this morning. And in verses 7 and 8, the last pair of verses, uh, a turn to the community. This isn't any longer simply about the psalmist and God, but it's about all of God's people together. So what I'll do then in the rest of our time is just walk briefly through these uh, four sections to see how they claim us and speak to us. Well, first of all, the first pair of verses where we hear the cry. Out of the depths, I've cried to you. And they present, of course, a plea that the psalmist might be heard. I think we're familiar with this kind of language, aren't we? We talk about being down in the depths. Oh, I'm a bit, a bit down in the depths. I'm a bit stressed, exhausted. Apparently that's a thing. You know, people can be exhausted just from nothing. Well, I think it is a, a thing. Uh, and certainly this is present in our psalmist cry out of the depths, I cry to you. It's interesting, this psalm has a Latin title. I wasn't going to mention this, but it seems appropriate somehow. De profundis. You can almost hear it, can't you? The profound depths that this psalmist finds himself in. In fact, it's a little bit more than being just down in the depths. This is a bit of an unusual word for depths here. Uh, only occurs five times in the Old Testament, and this is, this is one of them. And in each of the other four cases where this word occurs, it always re- refers to the, the watery deep. Think of the San Andreas Trench, not that the psalmist had ever heard of the San Andreas, the depths of the ocean. Much more appropriately, think of Jonah. Do you remember the story of Jonah? It's another place where this word occurs. And Jonah, on account of his own rebellion, has been thrown into the sea. And in Jonah chapter 2, chapter two, he's praying as he sinks to the bottom of the sea. And as he sinks, he cries out with these words, The engulfing waters threatened me. The, the deep, that's our word, the deep surrounded me. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank. The earth beneath barred me in forever. He's at the very gates of death. And why? Because of his own sin, his own rebellion. 
So you can see it's a little bit more than feeling blue. It's out of a place of real despair. And despair not just because maybe we're upset about how life's going, but really because of the entanglements of our sin. That's the kind of depths that the psalmist has in mind here. Of course, it catches up all those other, perhaps smaller, it's still real, but perhaps smaller uh, downers that we experience in our life. Uh, But we hear something of a deep, deep place in this cry. And so it gives some sharpness to the next thing that the psalmist says. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to me. So the psalmist is addressing God, the God, the maker of all that is, seen and unseen, creator of heavens and earth, and says, listen to me. That's, that's the force of the, these words. You, you know, you, you have your minions, or perhaps your kids, or now that I'm <clears throat> turning into <clears throat> something of an <clears throat> aged parent myself, listen to me, <laughs> attend. You know, we say this when we want that hearing to result in action, don't we? And that's what the psalmist has in mind here, but he's addressing the living God of Israel. The cry as he pours out this pleading to God that God would respond in action. And that last little word, my, to this cry for mercy, well, it's a, a good translation. If any of you had the King James with you this morning, you'd have heard the, the voice of my supplications. Again, there's a kind of earnestness here, uh, which is related to another word that I think it's helpful to hear just shimmering behind this word for mercy. You know, it's not often you find devotional help in a Hebrew lexicon. Take it from me. Uh, But one of the big reference works on the Hebrew language has this little gloss for the word that we're looking at this morning, the precise word. It says, this word means the expressions of a mind beset with terror, a plea that God be gracious. And in fact, the Hebrew word for graciousness is the word that's lurking behind this cry for mercy. It's a, it's a call for God to, be, to show his grace in expressing this mercy. So perhaps even in looking at these first couple verses in the psalm this morning, it's It's something that you've heard last week and the week before, no doubt week by week, but I think we are downhearted people. And perhaps this is a word worth hearing again, especially if we think about the entanglements of sin in our lives, that it doesn't involve a turning away from God. That's maybe our temptation, that in my sin, in my despair, but not this psalmist, This psalmist shows us a better way to cling to him, to cry to him, because he is a gracious and merciful God. Well, that's the plea. There is a content, some content for his prayer as well. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, and therefore you're feared. Again, familiar words. Again, another little surprise, I think. We might expect on the basis of saying, you know, listen to me and do what I'm I'm asking for. We might get the thing that is asked for, if you follow. Do you you remember the story of blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10? You know, Jesus is by Jerusalem. It's a blind beggar wailing away, son of David, son of David. And everybody's saying, shut up. And Jesus hears him, calls him over, says, what do you want? And Bartimaeus said to him, Lord, I want to see. He tells him what he wants. It's what you'd expect, isn't it? But not this psalmist, or not at this point. Rather, the psalmist reflects on what it would be like if this God was not this God. A meditation that says, if this, is, if this wasn't true, what would it be like? Lord, if this wasn't true, who could stand? But the psalmist knows it doesn't stay there, and thank God that's not the case. Because we read in verse 4, with you there is forgiveness, 
an affirmation piercing the darkness that this God is a forgiving God. This God is a forgiving God. And what response does that draw out of us? Well, we might think of gratitude, certainly. Love, certainly. But again, that's not where the psalmist goes. Another little surprise. Therefore, you are feared. This is a word we have a little anxiety about when we see it in Scripture, don't we? But just as we were thinking about a biblical sense of what waiting is, I think we need a biblical sense about what fearing is. There is some sense that I'm not coming up to the great cuddly toy in the sky. It's just the God who made all that is. All seen and unseen. There is a kind of default sense for fear here that I think is, is operative and we do well to bear in mind. But that's not all there is here. There is, of course, more. And what does the psalmist have in mind? Well, uh, you might think I live in the past. We started with Luther. I wonder how many of you have heard of John Owen, uh, a 17th century Puritan pastor and theologian. Uh, In England, he was for some years in Oxford. Don't hold that against him. Um, But in his 50s, he was a seasoned pastor at this point. He was about to embark on the great work of his life, an eight-volume commentary on Hebrews. But as he did that, he started off by writing a 350-page treatise on Psalm 130. You laugh. How about if I tell you 200 of those 350 pages, fully 200, are devoted to his pastoral unpacking of verse Four. Oh yes, the Puritans knew how to read their Bibles, didn't they? So I'm, I'm not going to read you all 200 pages this morning. Um, but I will read you a little paragraph where Owen provides a paraphrase of these two verses to pull out in language of the 17th century what, what he, wants, he believes they convey. And I think they speak with some power even if they are a bit old-fashioned. So this is, this is his paraphrase of verses 3 and 4. Although, O Lord, no man can approach unto thee, stand before thee, or walk with thee, if thou shouldst mark their sins and follies according to the tenor of the law, nor could they serve so holy and great a God as thou art, how great thou art. Yet because I know from thy revelation that there is also with thee on the account of Jesus Christ satisfaction, pardon, and forgiveness, I am encouraged to continue with thee, waiting for thee, worshipping thee, when without this discovery I should rather choose to have rocks and mountains fall upon me to hide me from thy presence. It's a little longer than our verses 3 and 4, but I think it captures well this, this sense of what's at stake in realizing the forgiveness of God. And this sense that in fearing God, it is to worship him. It is to serve him in newness of life clearly recognizing our own condition, clearly recognizing the character of this great God. Well, there is the cry with its plea, the content of the prayer, and there is this waiting that we've heard about already this morning. Did quite a bit of my job for me. This waiting that's expressed in just a little bit of a different metaphor than the one that Michael read earlier. This waiting and hoping, waiting and hoping, two words that often come together, especially in the Psalms and also in the prophets. And what is the psalmist, for what does the psalmist wait, in what does the psalmist hope, but for a person and a promise, for the Lord and for his word. Well, it's a very nice sense that we have of what that active waiting is. It's not simply a passive thing. 
this thing that we look forward to and, and changes us somehow. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a difference between waiting and hoping, isn't there? You know, I can, I can wait for the bus. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the bus. That's what I'm doing. I'm wait- you listen to something on your whatever. You just. But if you're hoping the bus comes before it rains, you're a little more invested, aren't you? And and that's the sense we have here. Yes, yes, a waiting, a looking forward. There's something coming, but invested in that thing. There's something at stake in that thing coming. And we have this metaphor, this picture language. My soul waiting for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. Watchman for the morning is the way the Hebrew runs. Let's just live into that picture for a moment. It's three in the morning. It's pitch black. You're cold. When's the next shift? It's still dark. You know morning's coming. Come on. There's an inevitability about what's ahead. And, and clearly the watchman waiting for the morning is invested. He wants, he wants to get warm. He wants to sit by the fire, get, get his cuppa, whatever it might be. It's a sure knowledge though, isn't it? The morning is coming. There is going to be light that pierces the darkness. And that's the sense we have here in this real turning as, as the psalmist puts his hope in this person and that promise that there is light that's going to pierce this darkness that I'm still in. I think that's part of the point here is that it's not a snap of the fingers. It, it, it's not something that all of a sudden everything's changed. Now it might be that. But what this psalmist says is that knowing this person and knowing this promise, my Hope, my waiting is more sure than this waiting for the coming of the morning. Well, that's the turn that our poet makes here. A little bit like Psalm 30. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. So there's the plea, and there's the prayer, and this is the patient hope, a sure hope rooted in the person of God and the promise of of God. And finally we come to this turn to the community and in it we find a proclamation. Again, I, some people find this quite a surprising conclusion to the psalm. It's been so intensely personal. It's about this psalmist and this psalmist's entanglement with sin and the crying out to God and, and the sure hope that comes as the psalmist sees This is who God is and this is the promise God has made. And some learned commentaries think this conclusion doesn't really fit. Maybe it was added later. I don't know. They think it's quite jarring. I beg to differ. I think it's the natural outcome for the soul that's experienced this hope and the the assurance of this promise in their lives. What's the next thing that you would do? Turn to the community and call to them to know this God and to know this hope, to know this life. You know, if you're wondering what to do this afternoon with your cup of tea, you could flip over to Lamentations chapter 3. There's another passage much like this one. A a poet there who's in desperate straits thinking about the ways in which God, yes, God has has uh, brought deep suffering into his life. And, but there comes a moment in that poem where the poet names the Lord for the first time. And at that moment, the poet says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And what's that poet go on to do? Turn to the community and say to them, let's test our ways, let's examine our ways, let's return to the Lord, 
Let's lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. Lamentations 3, verses 40 and 41. And that's, that's precisely what we see here, this turn to the community to proclaim out in this natural overflow the bounteous redemption that comes. Because, of course, verse 8, I think it's even more emphatic than we might see it. There isn't a stinginess here. There isn't a grudging sense that, oh, maybe, maybe not, maybe God will do this. Let me, let me flip the translation just a little bit for you. With him is full redemption. Well, bounteous with him is redemption. Bounteous. It's, it's full. An overflowing of grace and mercy that comes from this God. He will redeem Israel from all their sins. There isn't a sin that God cannot or will not forgive. There is not a sin which this God cannot or will not forgive to those who turn to him in repentance and faith. And as John Owen put it in his paraphrase of those earlier verses, confident in the revelation that we have, we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, Old Testament saints also knew that God was a gracious God, merciful and forgiving. How much more we see that when we can look to Jesus, especially with this table spread as it is this morning. Well, I need to draw these thoughts to a close. Just a couple of things to conclude with. We've been very much living in the Old Testament this morning. There are some New Testament echoes of this psalm, uh, more than one. Uh, One of them comes in the Song of Zechariah. Do you remember Christmas time? Wasn't, wasn't that long ago. So, Zechariah is the, is the father of John the Baptist. And as he's given voice, he sings at the birth of John the Baptist. And he says, he has visited and redeemed his people. And Zechariah's song as it unfolds, very much echoing our Psalm uh, 130. The moment when the Messiah comes, the promised one to save God's people. This is the verse that inspires Zechariah's song. Or the Apostle Paul was thinking about the answer to this question. How how can we be confident in this hope? How can we know that this gospel psalm is true? How, How can we know that we depend on it? And he speaks to Christians waiting in this present age, as he puts it. And at the end of Titus chapter 2, talking about patiently waiting in this present age, he writes that we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. In the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, purifying for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works, Titus chapter 2. So that's the culmination and trajectory of this psalm then. It finds its target in the gospel itself. And so, possibly Luther wasn't far wrong, was he? If this stands, the church does indeed Stand, If you, O Lord, kept hold of our sin, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. So then, uh, as we draw these thoughts together, I, I trust that this encourages us to have some clarity about our condition. We don't need to be afraid to face ourselves and even see the darkness and the entanglements that are in our lives. Like the writer to the Hebrews said, the sin that so easily entangles. That's that's our fallen condition. If we have clarity about that, we can also have conviction about the character of this God, this God whose grace and mercy are lavish and full, which we see fully displayed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose love was so great, he laid it down so that 
we too might live. And a confidence, this active, patient, persistent, persevering hope and waiting. Confident that the one who began a good work in us will see it to completion. And finishing with this bold call. O Israel! O Invercaving! Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. Well, that's our call as gospel people. I pray that's been an encouragement and a help to you this morning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word which speaks truth to our lives. It speaks truth with love. The love uh, that while we were yet sinners, Christ laid down his life for us. Showing us far more clearly than this psalmist could ever know that with you there is forgiveness. Help us, Lord, so to fear you out of gratitude and love to be those who look to you more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Lord, may your light pierce our darkness. May we serve you in the places and in this time in which you've called us to live for your glory's sake. 